So welcome everyone tonight. Now, before we get started, I want to open this with offering this land acknowledgement. Multnomah County is sited upon the ancestral homelands of the Multnomah, Malala, Kathlamet, Chinook, Clackamas, Tualatin Kalapuya, and many other indigenous nations. These nations have become the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde, the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians, and the Chinook Nation and Kalitz Nation in Washington State. Land acknowledgments recognize and respect the enduring relationship that indigenous people have with traditional homelands. The effects of colonization can still be felt today and land acknowledgments are a small step down the path of repair, reconciliation and cultural revitalization. And this particular land acknowledgement is courtesy of Melanie Phi. So thank you for allowing me to uh, present that. We have some housekeeping information. The library event. Oh, cool. That's so that's one of them. <laughs> Let's stay muted so that we uh, uh, don't have any background mm -hmm. noise coming through. Uh, we really appreciate if everyone could mute their uh, um, microphones. I almost said cameras. Cameras on or off is up to you, but mute your microphones. But please do feel free to say hi and introduce yourselves in the chat. We actually have an icebreaker question care of our lovely guest. And the question is, do you ever wake up in the middle of the night with the perfect retaliation sentence to a fight that ended years ago? So again, do you ever wake up in the middle of the night with the perfect retaliation sentence to a fight that ended years ago? So while you're thinking about that, you can answer in the chat. And while you're pondering and answering, again, make sure you have the supplies that are needed for tonight, which are five to 10 blank sheets of paper, a pencil, a Sharpie or another drawing implement. Um, and if you made five photocopies of a photo of yourself or someone else, as mentioned in the event reminder, make sure those are handy as well. Um, once again, please keep your microphones muted so we don't get the background noise coming through during our event tonight. Um, if you have any questions, you can drop them in the chat and our brilliant library staff, Allison and Israel are here to help you out. So something about Everybody Reads. This is our 20th anniversary of Everybody Reads, the library's community-wide reading project. We'll be sharing the link to upcoming events in the chat and they include a conversation with Sikh Captain America, Vishwajit Singh, a workshop on equity in comics, a Bollywood dance party, speaking of Zoom dance parties, um, and lessons, and more. And all of this is made possible in part by gifts to the Library Foundation, and Mira Jacobs' lecture in March is made possible by literary arts. And you can pick up a free copy of the book at your nearest Multnomah County Library, along with the project guide. Our speaker tonight, the moment you've all been waiting for, our speaker tonight is none other than Mira Jacob, the author of this year's Everybody Reads book, Good Talk, A Memoir in Conversations. And this book was shortlisted for the National Book Critics, Critics Circle Award and named a New York Times notable book. And our multi-talented speaker is also a novelist and cultural critic and a memoirist and illustrator and so many others. So please welcome the brilliant Mira Jacob. Oh, thank you. That was such a nice introduction. I'm really, I'm loving reading the responses um, in the chat. Uh, some of you do in fact wake up with uh, the perfect response. I, I don't actually wake up, I should say this, with the perfect response. Like I'm convinced it is the perfect response. And then by the time it's actually daylight and I say it out loud, I'm like, that's a terrible idea. That was a terrible idea at three in the morning. It is a terrible idea now. That fight was over five years ago. You must, you must let it go. Um, but part of the reason I asked that question is because the book, and weirdly, I only have the English copy, um, the UK copy with me. So this book is a series of um, conversations, right? It's a series of conversations that were sort of rattling around in my head and ones that I couldn't forget, um, kind of no matter how, how much I wanted to in, in certain situations. So what I did was 
the way that the book actually um, started was my son, and it's the first chapter of the book, my son started asking me all these questions about Michael Jackson, um, cause he was obsessed with Michael Jackson. Like he was amazingly obsessed with Michael Jackson. He had the glove, he had the moves. Um, and he at one point was asking me what color he's like, mommy, what color is Michael Jackson Brown? And I said, uh, you know, he's, he's black and his skin is Brown. Um, then he sort of, you know, he, he turned white and he was, he turned white. And I said, yeah. And he goes, am I going to turn white? And I was like, no. And he goes, are you? And I was like, no. And he said, daddy. And I was like, daddy's already white. And he said, what was he always? And then I had to draw that as a conversation because it was so bizarre and so specific to, I thought my family. And then I immediately was like, I bet this isn't specific to my family. I bet there are a lot of mixed race kids with a lot of questions about themselves that they don't see. And that of course turned me into thinking about all the questions that I still had um, about growing up in this country that were sort of never answered. Um, and that got really uh, a lot more pronounced, I would say a lot more scary for me when Trump was elected, because I think a lot of things that I had taken for granted about, about America or just sort of put, put to the side in some way, in some very, um, in some both kind of blind and privileged and just wishful thinking kind of way, um, all that went away. And so I started writing down um, all these conversations, which is what the book is. But to go back to that Michael Jackson piece, um, one of the one of the things that that he asked me. So those questions are really funny about Michael Jackson, the first ones. And then he said um, later on, he said, "Are white people afraid of brown people?" And I didn't know what to say and we were on a subway and I didn't want to lie to him. So what I ended up saying was sometimes, which is just not the answer you actually want to give your, you know, six year old child. It's not really what you want to say. Um, it didn't feel reassuring, but it also, I didn't want to do the thing where I said something that wasn't true. And then later he would wonder if I had ever told him the truth. So it felt like the right thing to say. But then later that night, when right as he was going to sleep, it just he did that thing that kids do where it's like, Bark! like his eyes open, he goes, hey, is daddy afraid of us? And I just, I mean, at the time, I was like, no, no. But afterward, I went and I sat in my bathroom, which is the only place you can get privacy in New York, um, in an apartment, and probably really anywhere if you're a mom. <laughs> but I went and sat, and I, I remember just shaking and feeling really unnerved. So what I ended up doing was I drew us as almost like these paper dolls and I cut us out and, you know, he was deep into this Michael Jackson obsession. He had all the albums. So then I went into his room and I got the albums and I put them on my dining room table and I put the, the puppets on top. And then I drew our conversations. I, I took white paper and I wrote out the conversation and I, and I kind of drew the cartoon bubble, um, and I put them on top of the album, and then I kept doing it. And then by the time it was done, I just sort of stood on my dining room table and took pictures and then cropped the pictures. And then when I was done, I had a thing. You know how sometimes you do something, and you're like, I don't know what I'm doing. This could be very unhinged. I mean, that's mostly, I do feel that way often about most creative ventures I take on, but I, I did it. And afterwards I was like, this is a thing. I made a thing. I made a thing out of this conversation that has been sort of flying around my head and telling me things about myself and my family, but I haven't been able to look at it yet. And it felt like such a relief, honestly, to do that, to have a place to catch the conversation. So tonight, what we're going to do is we are going to do that together. We're going to try to catch a conversation. And so I'm going to do two things. Um, first, I'm going to read a tiny little bit um, from that book where um, you know, kind of the uh, one of the chapters, so you can see how I did it in a more formal way. But then I'm going to walk you through doing it ourselves. So hold on one sec. Let me do the screen share. Okay, here we go. All right, and Sadaka, if you can't see it, then yeah, you just you just yell if you can't if, if this any of this goes wrong. Okay, so this is the book cover, obviously, and I'm just going to read to you this one little section. Hey, 
This is me and my son Z. Hey, so I was thinking about that stuff the other day, and I think maybe you should ask, talk to daddy, ask him if he's scared of you. I don't want to. Knock, knock. What? Knock, knock. Who's there? Mouse. Mouse who? Mouse, I am looking for my teeth. That's not, that's not really how a knock, knock joke works. Watch. Knock, knock. Who's there? Canoe. Canoe who? Canoe come out and play with me? Get it? Yes. I just, I think if you ask daddy himself and then make him a part of the conversation, then you make him a part of the conversation, you know, which is good because knock, knock. Can we, okay, who's there? Big, big heart. Big heart who? Big heart underpants gorilla. I am not asking daddy about it. Why not? Because I don't want to hurt his feelings. But it won't hurt his feelings. He will feel left out. No he, because we are brown and he is not and it will make him sad. Oh. You, you know what though? I don't think it will. I think if you just knock, knock, tell him he'll feel like he's part of us because knock, knock. We're a family and we knock, knock. Who's there? Canoe. Canoe who? Canoe stop talking about this? Eh. All right. So, so that's how one of those conversations work. I think you can sort of see um, the back and forth there. And the way that I did that, and hold on, I'm going to show you. Um, so we're going to do this together now. But the basic ingredients that you could see, hopefully, are um, the two of us as these kind of still characters and then the way that conversation plays out. So to do that, we have to talk about two things. Um, one is how we're gonna make these sort of representations of ourselves. And you guys can do um, really whatever you please. If you, have, if you have a photocopy of a photograph of yourself, you can cut it out and put that at the bottom of the page. Um, I always turn the page um, so that it's like the long, the long side is there and I put the characters at the bottom, sorry. The screen is blurred so maybe you couldn't see that. But, um, I do it so that I have the most room possible to write the dialogue. You can do that. We're going to go into representation characters. But the main thing that I also want you to think about is talking, how people talk. Because one of the things, I mean, I'll just say that one of the things I really love about us as humans <laughs> is, that we, is that we talk. And if you think about what talking is, talking is basically like one person uh, sorry, is there's, can we mute that? Um, talking is basically like when you are talking, when people are talking to each other, it's basically that you are blowing noises through your mouth hole to somebody in the hopes of being understood, right? Like that's a wild concept. Like if you've ever seen, um, if you've ever seen like Arrival where the aliens are so cool that they build this like language, this beautiful round language and world peace breaks out and you're like, oh, it could have been that or we can have noises in our mouth holes. So if you think about how that works, the noise in the mouth hole part, what that means is when you are talking to someone and trying to communicate to them, they are partial, partially listening with their ear holes but most of what they're doing is thinking about the noise they're going to blow back at you. So they miss entire parts of your conversation, which you could see even there with my son in that really tiny moment. Um, you know, just I just had an agenda. I had an agenda which was which was totally simple. Let's make daddy uh, feel part of our, our brown and, and our mixed race family, um, even though you and I are the same color, right? Just let's just throw that on the kid. But you can see I had this idea of how we were all going to come together and he had an idea about how he was going to tell a knock knock joke. Um, one of us completed our mission, obviously, by the chapter's end. So I'm going to show you guys Give me one second. I'm going to share my screen again and we're going to talk about how to do this. All right. Can you see that? Yeah. OK. I'm really going by your thumbs up, Sadaka. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so how to write good talk. Let's just talk about how to do this. Okay, so first of all, you don't have to draw complicated versions of yourself at all. And a lot of times when I, so a lot of times when I'm doing this, I'll write scripts, but when I'm laying out a page, I don't even put in the real drawings. I just draw loose representations. So for this one, um, I just like, I made this ridiculous version of me and my best friend, 
um, Allison. So this is my rough approximation for it. So just so you guys can do this at home, if you don't feel like, um, if you don't feel like drawing is your forte, that is completely fine. Do something that you can do over and over again. Make one person a rectangle and another person a circle. It really doesn't matter. What you're doing is holding space for a character and knowing that that character is going to say certain things that are going to track down one side of the page and the other is going to say the things that track down the other. Just that simple. So I'm going to give you guys, why don't we take just, let's take, sorry, how about we take five minutes right now for people to draw for a minute to come up with their two characters. Um, and we right. will, yeah, okay. And so we're gonna do this. We're just gonna talk to each other, you guys. If you have questions, you can pop them in. But what you're trying to do right now is come up with a representation for, if it's you and someone else, if it's two people you overheard, a representation for two different characters. Make it as simple or complicated as you want, but you're gonna, if, if your conversation goes over a few pages, you're gonna have to draw it a few times. So just know that. Um, and you can leave us, so I'm going to set my timer for five minutes, just so we know when to stop um, talking. But y'all can leave us on. If we're distracting, you can set your own timer for five minutes and come back. Whatever works. I just set it for an hour and five minutes, so that's really not the time I'm giving you. <laughs> we're, back. we're back to five minutes. Um, so, yeah, all right. Timer. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. You, you be in charge of the back timer. <laughs> No, but you know, it's so funny. So we're talking about um, drawing and, you know, and I think some people are very, very um, adept with drawing. I didn't actually know how to draw um, at the level I had to learn um, when I started the book. That was I, my question I really, for you. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I didn't know. I mean, my first, I could draw people looking things. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I was reasonably good at a rough approximation, but not in this way where you could just, I could just churn it out um, and figure that out. And a lot of what I had to do was in, in the moments that I was writing the book and in the moments that I was getting my head around, what are these conversations going to be? I was also um, doing this thing where I was just drawing all the time, trying to crack how to draw faces, um, which was, which was hard, you know, it's, it's actually, it's, you know, trying to, trying to kind of get them right. And also because all of my faces, if you saw, they all have a little bit of a, it's like a face where they could be saying anything. Mm -hmm. And that's not really how people's faces look in pictures. Like if you're drawing from a picture, people's faces are always animated. So pulling back on the animation was kind of my, my big learning curve was how to sort of make that perfect pan face, which was kind of hard for me. That's the really unique thing about, I mean, I love graphic um, novels and many of them are memoir in nature. And I really love that about this because yeah, you're, you're it's um, you're using one representation of like yourself and your son and your best friend and your husband and they're used throughout the book. I mean, sometimes there are iterations where it changes on age. Um, which is really delightful when you're a child and having all these experiences with like, you know, these conversations. But it was really interesting with the different backdrops. And it's not like the intent and the tone doesn't come through. It absolutely does, maybe stronger because it doesn't always match the face. But you did pick the right faces to kind of match any kind of conversation that's taking place. You know what's so funny about that, actually? Um, so it was really hard for my first editor. Um, he really had a hard time with the, the dissonance between the character's face and the lack of emotion and the, and the conversations, which can sometimes be really painful. Um, and it was a really interesting thing because he said, you know, I wonder if you can, I wonder if you can make like one face that's like a cry face. And I was like, a cry face. And he said, or like, or maybe like a, like just a, a kind of disgruntled face. <laughs> it's like, I think I have disgruntled resting face, so that's not going to be a great idea. Um, <laughs> but um, but I, I felt this really, you know how when you're doing something, sometimes you're like, no, no. And sometimes it's just utter laziness, but actually this wasn't. I, I had this really strong instinct to just not have it be that. Um, because the idea when he said maybe a cry face immediately, I didn't want to draw it. I just knew I was like, I do not want to draw that face. I do not want to draw that face. And later I thought about it. I was like, oh, because that is my face. 
because every day in America right now, I am like walking quietly to some place behind some door and like sobbing and then like sucking it all back in to just go about my day. And I didn't want to have to draw it. And I said, well, what happens to you if I, like he said, it's just very, it's just very um, disconcerting if I don't see the emotion. And I said, well, what happens? And he said, well, then I just have to, I just have to hold it. And I was like, that's it. That's it. Yeah. You hold it. Back. Yeah. Like you hold it. Like Cause that, I'm that so tired of holding it. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it felt like yeah, and that's this was you know written and published in the before times. You know, okay, yeah. the before times meaning yeah. before pandemic. Yeah, before pandemic. Um, yeah. Shorthanded to the before times and yeah. quarantine. Uh -huh. and all that. <laughs> um, so it, it's interesting because I think the fact that it's a static face throughout actually resonates stronger. It, so I read it when it was published in the before times, yeah. and then I, as I was telling you, I read it again last night. And maybe with my my kid being older and with everything we've experienced in the past couple of years, I feel like the um, the static face has resonated stronger for me. I feel like it made more sense, you know? Um, yeah. I could kind of just feel the conversation better, maybe. That's maybe really I interesting. I had, oh, we're, our five minutes are oh. up, y'all. Um, oh, okay. I just want to do a quick check with our people. I'm just going to quickly look through can you guys give me a little like thumbs up if you got your, can you like, yeah, I've got my characters. I've got some to work with. All right, all right, all right. I appreciate you. Thank you. Okay, cool. All some right, so. Claps. All right, I love this. This is amazing. Hi guys. Um, this is so much fun. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna go through a little bit with you about how I write dialogue and then edit it down so that you can do this too, all right? So here is a conversation that I am having with my best friend. How are you? I'm fine. Are you sure? You seem weird. Okay, I'm weird. What happened? Sometimes I think people are terrible. Why do you think that? Because people are terrible. Okay, so that was the whole conversation, right? Um, that was, that was, this is just a, this is just a sample conversation, but let's say I wanted to draw that. If you look at that, there's a lot of back and forth happening there for not quite enough emotional impact. So I'm going to want to edit this. There's a lot of error in there. So how do you edit it? Let's go to, let's go to this. Okay. So this is one version of editing it where I just literally just cut off the entire bottom half. You guys see how that goes? So let's see what that looks like for our characters. How are you? I'm fine. Are you sure you seem weird? Okay. I'm weird. Okay. If we stop it there, then what we're holding on to in that moment, the beat that we're landing on is the truth of the weirdness, right? So that's the part that we're holding. Let's try a different one. Okay, so this one, you guys, you can see I cut out the whole first part, all the preamble, all the what happened, nothing but just the we're going to get right to it. Sometimes I think people are terrible. Why do you think that? Because people are terrible, right? So if we hold that one, I mean, there's a little, this is, this is also, by the way, my, my dark humor, because I just think it's hilarious to repeat things that are <laughs> perfectly unsettling. Um, and I like the beat of this, but you're holding on to, then you're holding on to that moment. You're holding on to this, what the person who's feeling the terribleness, what they're feeling. Okay. Let's try another one. Hold on. Okay. This is the one where I cut out everything in between. And I show you guys this one. Because one of my favorite things about dialogue, one of my very, very, very favorite things about dialogue is that subtext is what generates the heat in dialogue. So it's everything that is not being said that your mind latches onto. So, you know, even when, when you leave so little on the page, it will do something. You will, you will snap a kind of attention. So let's see how this one goes. How are you? People are terrible, right? There's, there's actually a punch between those right? You can feel it. Yeah. It's this like, it's this funny thing where it's like, oh, that's, that's where you're at. Um, and you sort of land hard in that moment. And there's something about it for me, like this to me really feels like um, how people speak to each other. You know what I was saying before about like you blow noises out of your mouth hole. Like this is one person doing the normal thing of how are you? And another person's in a place of like, I, nothing is okay. People are terrible. And this to me feels very close to actually how we 
communicate um, just as humans to each other. Okay, I have one more, which is sort of the me edit. All right, so this is how I would have probably edited this for my sensibility, um, also knowing my best friend and knowing the kind of conversation that we have and, and what it means for us to kind of hit these beats together. So let's see how that plays out. How are you? Fine. You seem weird. Okay, I'm weird. What happened? People, right? So that, then that to me is also, for me, that's the funniest one because, man, people just happen, you know? And there's nothing we can do about it. There is nothing we can do about it. Um, and I don't, and I don't know how we're ever going to make it through this world. But just that for me, the reason that I would choose that one is because I know, first of all, I know my best friend um, really well. And I know the thing that we're talking about at the end of the day is that she's just having problems relating to people, right? And so we're going to land on that one. So I want you guys to write your own dialogue. I'm going to get, I'm going to throw this up here. These are instructions. Don't panic. I'm going to leave this one up here. We're going to, we're going to be talking again. I'm going to give you 15 minutes to write a dialogue. Okay. Um, Sarah and I, we'll just, we'll just talk about anything. Um, but this is the, what you're going to do. And I'm going to, I'm going to go through it with you. So you're going to write down a conversation that you had that you still think about. You can do a big moment. You can do a small moment. Um, I think personally that small moments are easier in a way to start with. Once you know how to work a small moment, then you'll definitely know how to do the bigger moment. Um, then you're going to do what I did. Edit, 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 right? To see all the different ways that I crossed out different things to get through, to get to some kind of story. So what is the subtext there? What is the thing that you're saying without saying? In mine, the thing I decided I was saying without saying is that people are problems. <laughs> <laughs> but you can choose you can choose something much lighter. Um, and and part of that is actually just sitting with what the conversation meant for you. So we're gonna do this now as an exercise and you all can do it, but also don't be surprised if tomorrow you're like, actually, you know what it would be? You know what the truer conversation would be? And then you have to go back and do it because with every chapter I wrote for this book, that's kind of what I was doing. All right, so what you're trying to do is honor the conversation by getting the beats right. So you're shortening, you're tightening, you're reworking. Okay, and we already did this part, make the visual representation, I know I spelled that wrong, sorry, of the two people or aliens or dogs, or aliens and dogs talking, okay? If someone wants, by the way, if someone wants to draw an alien and a dog talking, I'm all in. Um, this can be simple, it can be complex, it can be simple now, complex later. Um, ideally, you guys, I love, when people do workshops with me and then they have to go and work on it for a week and then and then they just have to post it and 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 tag me in the library that's my dream should anyone need to do that i will be here to receive your work um okay and then what you're going to do to do this is place your characters at the bottom of the page and then you lightly write in the dialogue that you have once you've got your final dialogue to see if it fits cut it shorter if it doesn't which happens to me often. I often lose sentences in this moment. Um, and then if also if it's like, oh, I can't possibly cut this, then you know that you're going to be doing a longer conversation, which is multiple pages, multiple panels, whatever you want to call it. If you're doing that, then I want you to think about where you're cutting it on one page and where you're, and where you're going to end it on the other, right? Because it's really important where you end the beat. What's that going to be? So think about that before you do it. Okay, and then the final, the final way, the final thing you're going to do is write in your final dialogue, draw the speech bubble around it, make sure it points to the right character's mouth, because I have definitely drawn it the wrong way before, and it's very embarrassing. Um, and then you've done it, okay? I know, I know it seems like a lot of steps, but really what you're doing right now is you're going to write down a conversation that you had, and I'm using my trusty timer again, um, big moment, small moment. You are going to, how about we do this, why don't I do 10 minutes for you to write down the conversation and then i'm going to um then i'm going to tell you when it's been 10 minutes and i'm going to give you five minutes so that you can edit it down okay does that feel about right that's what i think what i would want all right anyway you can fight me in the chat if that isn't right hold on all right you guys i got you i got you going for 10 minutes start writing all right 
And if you need All to, right. you can mute us or lower the volume on us if it's distracting. Yes. But I do I suggest that you put on your own timer. You to, yeah. Yeah. I can try to be a visual distraction to let you know that your timer is up. You know, I can, I can, um, I can turn off and on the light. <laughs> ah, yeah. I was thinking. <laughs> oh, no, I like that too. I like that. Or we could just do, we can be doing dance. You know, yeah, they don't want to see that. We can, I'm inspired. I'm so sorry. This dance party. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this dialogue component actually just, I think it just made me realize why I love reading graphic novels so much because I live for good dialogue. I love that and watching, you know, TV shows, whether it's oh, yeah. drama or comedy. Um, in the yeah. books that I like to read, I love dialogue and I love clever and witty, sarcastic and, you know, like all the punches. And I was wondering, especially in a conversation, well, this is a memoir. So everybody is very, you know, sacred to you, like your best friend and your son and your husband. Oh yeah. To edit down. Did it feel like, I mean, of course you can always put words back, but to kind of feel like, oh, I'm, my heart, oh, yeah. it hurts. You know, like that's where, at least as a radio producer, as a podcast producer, I really struggled and I still struggle with editing because I feel like whatever my guest has to say, every single word is sacrosanct, even the um, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a challenge. No, I mean, that's, it is a challenge. I mean, fortunately, unfortunately, um, these were, the conversations as I remember them. So I didn't feel like, oh, you know, I, I knew that I was recreating a conversation, but by the way, it was, was one of the funnier um, questions that was asked of me when I was touring was, how do you know that this is the conversation? Did you have a recorder with you every single time? And I was like, no, I was five. I didn't even know what a recorder was. But I also, <laughs> well, I will say that I think, like we'll all, we'll all be gone from each other in half an hour. And you will remember this conversation in a completely different way than I will, right? Um, partly because I'll be like, what did I say? I don't know, word salad. But you will, you will take away different things than I do. So the conversations, they already live in you quite differently. So there's always, to me, a difference between honoring that, the way the conversation lives in you, and flat out lying. And I know when I'm lying. I, I know when I'm writing so now something that's like that is absolutely not true and it doesn't even it doesn't even get the spirit of what was being said to me um and this usually is how it landed on you isn't that the point yeah. of yeah especially there's so much about colorism which is a horrific thing in our community horrific oh yeah yeah and that and that and it's so funny because those things when I was writing those down by the way I was sort of imagining all of India being like, but why are you complaining about this? You know, like, this is so normal. This is so, this is like, you got your feelings hurt about this um, because colorism is so it's just, accepted. Yeah. It's just what it is, right? I just go there and I'm permanently too dark and everyone will remind me of that. Um, and And the idea that I could be heard about it, I think is really, it's just, I think it's, it's borderline eye roll territory for them, you know? Yeah, I think you're right. I think there's something to be said about that. And I think um, I've definitely seen that evolution with like some of the aunties and cousins, un uncles and cousins who have maybe spent significant time in India and then moved here for a significant time. So they've had the shift, you know, it's not like they've yeah. been to visit or just have moved in. Yeah, yeah. And mm -hmm. seeing, oh, this is a really terrible thing that happens. Or even having your own children and seeing the slew of the onslaught of insults that can come that way. I do love how you portrayed your parents coming to your defense, like, don't listen to them, don't listen to them. That was <laughs> excellent. That was you know, I always think like, thank goodness that was their response because yeah. they're both lighter than me. And thank goodness their response was like, that's not even a thing, don't, don't, do not interact with them. Yeah. 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 It's, and then we have a whole different drama here with the same issue, you know, and yeah, it's so, it's always relevant, unfortunately, for, for better, or for worse. But, um, yeah. But back to what you were saying with like, I think the whole point is not, did you have a recorder and is this, you know, like a, a historical document with peer reviewed studies and all that? It's like, no, this is, how I felt as a child that I drew, you know, <laughs> because, and obviously yeah. it did 
land on you significantly because you still remember it all these years later. Like I have a phenomenally terrible memory, but there are things that I remember. And yeah. I mean, a lot of it is always negative, right? Like we remember more oh. negative than positive and I don't know why. Yeah. I mean, the things that I remember the most, honestly, are times when I did something wrong. You know, like I always like, I, I actually wake up more often than I wake up with the perfect like fight comeback. I wake up remembering something hideously embarrassing that I did when I was like 19. And I'm just like, why, why did you, why? And I, and I'm like trying to crawl out of my own skin, you know, like can somebody else be that girl, you know, can somebody else take on that person that did that? And, and sometimes it's things I said, a lot of times it's things I've done, you know? Yeah. That's another universal, at least in our generation. <laughs> I, think we, I think we have like, in, in some way, I mean, it was hard growing up. I think the two of us in our generation um, yeah. being immigrants' children. And I mean, especially you were in a small city or a small town, um, but uh, hang on, I lost myself. Um, but I think uh, I just lost my train of thought, but, but you know, um, it was easier to be like, oh, why did I do something stupid when I was 19? Because the following generations do not have that luxury, you know? <laughs> no. Life totally. It's so very hard now. I know. I know. I wonder about that with them. Um, but I do also feel like there's a little more forgiveness for the complication of the conversation. Yeah. I don't know if that's between people, not online. Online is like a terror, a terror zone. But um, between humans, between actual humans talking to each other, I feel like there's a little more understanding, certainly, than when I was growing up for like that that hurts and I'm going to tell you why. And instead of the immediate, like, that's not what happened or it doesn't really hurt or I, you know, but I'm a good person. Like I feel like people now have a place for, okay, let me receive that. Let me receive that. And, and just, not immediately. just starting. I would say it's just, just starting. Um, yeah. Okay. Maybe that's a fantasy. Is that a fantasy? <laughs> a fantasy? No, I, I think still live in that world too. Like there's like two silver linings of COVID. And one of them is that, I feel like generally speaking, and I'm really am casting that net wide, you know, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. there are plenty of frontline workers who can totally correct me if I'm wrong. I want to believe people are giving each other more grace nowadays because life is really <laughs> difficult. Um, but at the yeah. same time, uh, as I was saying, I think, you know, generations after us have it much harder. Um, I'm hoping like for our children, you know, um, that, uh, that it's not hard the way it was for us when we were growing up as brown kids in predominantly white areas or as immigrants' children um, trying to navigate a lot, you know, between cultures and languages. And there, it's like a bigger generation gap between us and our parents just because of that cultural shift, you know, and compared yeah. to like yeah. my, cousins, my younger cousins and their parents or my cousins who remained in India and stuff. Yeah. I mean, I wonder about that. I wonder if it's going to be um, easier for them. I think one of the things that um, I do know, like my son, because he's growing up in, in Brooklyn, um, oh, wow. he definitely does not feel like, you know, I grew up in a place where my family was the third Indian family to move into the oh, state of New Mexico. <laughs> but this is, by the way, not according to the census, this is according to the other two Indian families that were there. Which um, I love that source that you um, <laughs> put noted. <laughs> The Avastis and the Koshis told us. Um, so, but it, but you know, just growing up that way, just just being such a um, an oddity. I watch the way that he is not that, and I am simultaneously delighted and jealous, which is yes. maybe just being a parent. But I'm simultaneously like, yes, this is happening, and also like, man, <laughs> I couldn't be like that when I was growing up. I know, I, simultaneously elated and jealous. I totally get that. I totally yeah. Get that. Which totally is a good thing, I think. It's exactly. All right, you all have like 50, 50 seconds left uh, for the ten minutes. I I believe I I did the timer right. I'll tell you guys that um that at one point in our talk I realized that I hadn't said it, so it might be slightly faster or slightly slower. Don't panic if it if you're not done. You got plenty of time. Um, but here's what I'm going to suggest because this is about to go off. We're going to keep talking for just another five minutes and I really will set the timer this time. 
Um, we're going to keep talking for another five minutes, and I want you to edit down whatever you have, wherever you've landed. Um, I want you to edit what you have down and think about how many either, you know, pages it's going to take or if it's going to take one page, what that's going to look like. And then if you if you're already done with everything, if you've already like got it exactly where you want to be, start flowing it in and to flow it in. Here's what you do. Just so you know. Hold on. Sorry, my timer's now decided to be very loud. Here's what you do to flow it in. Um, I always write very lightly um, on, on the paper when I'm doing the conversation. I write it very lightly first and sort of see how it would fit um, and see how it would fit in a bubble. And I try to do it all the way down to, to the last point. And then if it's not fitting, I go, I go ahead and I start, you know, erasing, pushing it up, seeing what that looks like. So that is all yours to do, all yours to play with. Um, and yeah. All right. You guys do that now. Um, start editing and doing that. And I am going to, I'm hoping by the way that um, we'll be able to share and see some of these um, after this is done. I'm setting my timer for five minutes and you can see me pressing start. See me pressing start. Um, I'm hoping that we can share some of these. So, you know, if you, if you can, if you can get it done, let me see it. I would love to see it. All right. We got five more minutes. All right. Yeah, and it's not a requirement you know to show your work, but it'd be fun. No, it's not a requirement. Yes, um, Elaine, I did say five minutes to edit. You can edit, you can flow it in, you can do um, whichever whichever thing you want. What we're trying to do ultimately is we're trying to get it to the stage where you have your characters and you have your dialogue, just as I wrote, as I wrote mine, you have your final dialogue on the sheet. That's what we're trying to get to. So wherever you are in the process, just keep going. We're going to keep talking. We are going to be taking questions. Um, five minutes to edit and draw. Well, hopefully, hold on. Somebody's asking, do I have five minutes to edit and, and draw? Um, right now, whatever part of the process you're in, if you're in editing, just edit. And you're going to keep drawing throughout the rest of our conversation. Um, if you're to the place where you're drawing, keep going there. I've done this enough times that I know sometimes people just get done very quickly. If you're not one of those people, don't panic, because I'm one of the people that doesn't get done quickly. You're going to have time. You know what I was just thinking, Sarka, though, is when you were saying, um, I hope that uh, people are giving each other a little more grace, or I think they might be. I was thinking of, um, you were saying uh, before we got on this about, yeah, you're a translator, right? So you were at your job, one of your kids was having a tantrum and somebody said, let's give, let's, let's take a break for the translator. Is that what I heard? Yeah. So for context, I'm a sign language interpreter and I was interpreting something on Zoom and um, my husband and I were both working and we had two kids and one of them was having feelings and the other one was at the time, I mean, he's a toddler now and he was a little baby and he was inconsolable and in my arms <laughs> and I need my hands. Um, so yeah. it was a disability justice content, which I love doing because there's so much, it's like the default is accessibility. It's not just something you have to request through bureaucracy, but that's another soapbox. But anyways, the point is that the speaker, this person whose talk I'm interpreting said, let's just pause. <laughs> let's give our interpreter a second because clearly she's, you know, <laughs> handling working from home and everyone was really sweet. They're like, oh, baby, are you okay? Are you tired? Because this was a very <sighs> inconsolable situation. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it was just, uh, it was so kind. Uh, um, I was thinking about I, that when I you were saying it. Yeah. Professionalism and you know, is this message coming through? Am I doing this well? And, and in that moment, I could not do my job. There was just no way my arm ah, occupied and my attention, much as I tried to focus, was not going to happen. And so I just really yeah. appreciated that she um, did that. You know, we just yeah. took a few minutes so that I could manage. <laughs> and, yeah. and then we continued and the world did not fall apart. Um, shockingly, taught, shockingly. You know? uh -huh. Like, I don't think they I mean, teach you the world will fall apart. I think they teach you, like, I don't know, there's some kind of... I think they teach you that they shouldn't, have, shouldn't have taken the job, yeah, woman, yeah. who has baby. I know, but it's yeah. just ridiculous, right? Because oh. I'm sure, and I'm sure many of the people on this call know, like, some of the most incredibly competent people I've met are the people that have, you know, either either children to take care of or elders to take care of or, like, other things in their lives to take care of. So they're very good at getting things done. And this idea that you're somehow supposed to be this, like, I don't know, sleek motorcycle of a person that 
bullets through everything um, just seems insane, right? It seems insane now that we are literally in each other's living rooms yeah. watching each other do all this stuff. Absolutely. And um, and COVID, Sean, maybe it's the second silver lining with, you know, and I say that in like a dark humor way. It's like, it really, we all know it completely shone a light on this for the whole world to see how not functional our society is, you know? And yes. There's just a reality. Like I am good at my job and I love what I do. I'm passionate about it. I also have <laughs> two small children. I work from home and if they're not in school, there's just kind of a reality that's going to happen. You know, yeah. I can't just like, you know, like I, I can't just like turn them off. You know? Yes, totally. <laughs> totally. And <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was having that moment. I told you guys earlier, you guys were, weren't, um, I was telling um, everyone that's running this incredible program for me that I, I had uh, COVID last week. I'm getting over it now, but um, like a couple of days ago, I was kind of crawling across a floor. So I'm really delighted to not be crawling across the floor right now. But I also, I, you know, I think in the past I would have felt like, oh no, this is just too embarrassing. I'm going to be a little bit scattershot tonight. Oh, there's my five minute timer. Don't panic. Keep going. I'm just going to keep talking. Um, and then I'm going to check in with you guys and see if, if people want to show us stuff. Cause I'd love to see it. Um, but I think in the past I would have, I would have felt panicky about how, how spongy my brain is right now. Um, or maybe not the, the sharpest version of itself, but I just thought, well, we're all kind of, I think we're all kind of here at this point. We all have like our loose ends, right? We all have our little, our frayed nerves. So we can just do this together. And I love doing this, by the way, like this thing that you guys are doing um, is, it's almost a meditation for me now. There are times, there are things that I think about and I, I kind of slot them into this visual medium so I can process them, so I can think them through. Um, and that's, you know, and that's, that's a hard thing. I'm going to just look at some of your comments right now. Okay. Um, yeah, somebody has posted um, a JPEG and we have some love from the audience. Oh, I'm so excited. Yeah. I'm so excited to see the JPEG. Hold on. I'm clicking on it. And click to open. Let's see if I, I hope it open. Let's see. So we have some love. We have a JPEG, and one person lives. The editing is really hard because, as I mentioned, as a radio producer, you feel that everything is needed, everything is sacrosanct, and then, but the whole point of editing is that you know, figuring out totally. What it is hard. Oh, it is hard. Yeah, and that's why I showed you guys all those different versions. There's not a right version. There's just the version that to you best reflects um, what you're doing. Okay, wait, I'm looking at Stephanie's. You guys, did you see this? Can everyone open this? Should I share my screen so you can see that? Let me see if I can. Hold on one sec. Let me see if I can share it this way. Um, let me try one thing, y'all. Okay, here we go. Ah, okay, here we go. Mom talked to Ellie about Portugal or Eli. Maybe. Yeah. Oh, Elizabeth. Okay. Once two weeks with mom without me. What does that mean? I guess I'll find another place to go for two weeks. What? You say you'd be away for three to four weeks. No, I know. I don't know. Ah, oh, love that. I love that. Also, I love the the kind of beautiful strangeness of the arms separated. That's just a, that's like a surrealist <laughs> dream. Mwah! Like, I love it. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> that's brilliant. Amazing. All right, I'm gonna stop this. So cool. Um, if you guys also, you guys can all thank see it. I think she also that. said. It. Yeah, thank you for sharing. That was amazing. It was amazing. Um, I love this. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing that, and I'm going to reshare my screen. Hold on. Dun, dun, dun. Just to show you guys what it looks like when I do a more kind of final version of this. So I've got your make how to make your own good talk. And then I'm going to show you what my real characters look like when I slot them in. So this is me and my best friend, right? How are you? Fine. You seem weird. Okay, I'm weird. What happened? People. Um, that's what we would look like in this way. And then what I do in my stuff is I always throw a picture in the background. 
so that you have that pop. Obviously, this one is stuck. Um, but just so you have that kind of that feeling, for me, part of what was fun about doing this book, and the whole book is done this way, was figuring out where these conversations were going to take place, um, what background. Sometimes I put in the real background. Sometimes I'd use a surreal background. But that in itself kind of gave me joy. Um, and you all can do that too. Like this is what, you know, when you do this, the way that I did it was I just cut out the bubbles and I put it on top of the Michael Jackson albums. You can do that too. Um, like place the conversation on top of something and take a picture of it and see what it tells you. See what it looks like. The best thing, you guys, like this is really fun, is if you take the picture on three different surfaces and then just look at them afterward and see what it does for you. Right. Like when I was doing this at first, I was just putting it on wood and then I'd put it on marble and then I would put it on, you know, an old bag of rice. Um, I really did do that. That's weird. But I did anyway. So but it all said different things. And actually, the bag of rice one was a conversation with my grandmother and it was a bag of basmati rice. And it was those burlap bags. Right. Those like burlap bags of basmati rice that we all grew up with. Oh, cool. And so. Yeah, old school. And when I put it on that, I just started crying. Why? I don't know. Because I have a rough, you know, I have a rough relationship with my grandmother. And also because the rice is the thing we still have in common, you know, and that felt like I, I felt like I finally hit the right thing. So you can you can do this. You know, you, you can take the conversation, you can place it on different things um, and you can see how you feel about it. You can also somebody said they were having a hard time figuring out what to what to edit and, and what to leave in. I sometimes meditate on these, you guys, for like weeks, just, you know, on two different lines. I'll just think about it for a long time and be like, which one, which thing, what is the thing I'm trying to say? You know, what is the thing that feels like the truest thing who we were in that moment? Um, the other thing I'll just tell you real quick about writing real conversations in your life is there's a question I always ask myself, and I'll talk about this more when we come um, and see you all in March. But one of the things that I often ask myself when I'm doing um, memoir and I'm writing about real people in my life is, are you writing this? And I did this for every conversation that was in the book. Are you writing this for clarity or for vindication? Because it's there's a pretty big difference. You don't always know when you start writing. Um, you don't know which one it is. So I wouldn't judge it. I wouldn't judge it out of the box. Sometimes you can surprise yourself by writing something that you think is going to be really mean and in the middle of writing it, you realize that there's something you didn't hear or something you didn't understand at the moment. And then you end up writing something that really does give you clarity. Um, you also will write things sometimes where you look at it and you'll be like, wow, I am only on my side here and there is no other side and it is really flat, right? Um, it's not telling me anything. Um, and those are the ones, I had a lot of those chapters in this book and I just threw them out. Like I went through, I think, I think 40 something chapters made it into the book and I threw out probably 35 because it just didn't, I just didn't. And it's not to say that I wouldn't revisit those conversations or even give another, give it another shot. But the person that I was in the moment that I was writing the book couldn't, couldn't quite get to the truth of that conversation. And I didn't want to put out something that felt like a lie. You know, can I make a request um, before you go on? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm just. This sounds like a kind of a healing process too, because I was oh, kind of like, oh my god, this feels almost doable for someone as unartistic as I am. Um, and I told you I love dialogue, but it's like vindication or clarity. That's um, and and Stephanie said in the chat that this gives me chills, and it's true. I felt it too. Um, it's, it is healing. And it, like you said, sometimes it's just your side. And sometimes you realize there's something you didn't hear in that moment, you know, like yeah. maybe 30 years later yeah. or the next day you do. That's incredible. Just one. Yeah. Me. You know, um, I'm a fiction writer first, right? I wrote, um, a novel and I'm working on another one now. And, um, but where that came from, uh, I, for sure, when I was going through a hard time in my life as a teenager, I once wrote a letter to a boyfriend and just lied, just lied, just made everything in it so much worse because, because something was happening in my family that, that felt really horrible and I needed to express it. Um, but I understood when I did that, that, um, that was the first time where I was like, oh, I told a lie. I told a lie to try to capture something about this. And I told a lie that made it cleaner because I needed this to be clean instead of messy. 
And I think about that a lot, you know, what that, what the difference is between those things. Okay, there's a question here that I wanna answer and I also wanna give people an opportunity to share. So let me answer this question and then should we let people share if they want to, is that cool? Um, I'm wondering, in the process of writing your book, how did you navigate writing about real people and their reactions to the work? Yeah, sure. Did you let folks uh, see it who were in it before it came out or take their perspective? No, um, no, honestly. Yeah, that's a, and it's a fair question. Um, the only person that I, uh, when you say, did I take their perspective? Um, I didn't take their perspective on the conversation at hand um, because because the thing I was exploring was the way it lived in me. Um, and I feel like that's a, that is a fine thing to do. I think we're often told, especially as women, like that thing that you're angry about is not, is not really the thing that happened. And I, I just don't, I don't find a lot of usefulness in that. Sometimes we're angry about things that live in a way for us for a real reason. And a lot of times I find that when you say this thing hurt me, then people who have been hurt by a similar thing are like, yeah, me too, it hurt me too. And there's a way to work with that. Um, for me, it's always about curiosity. Are you curious um, at the end of the day? Are you, is there a way to make sense of both what this is, but also what is the work that you do as a community member um, and as a family member, what are you, what do you do to forward that conversation? So to answer your question, I didn't, um, I didn't, vet the conversations before I put them out, because I'm sure people would be like, that's not the way I remember it. And they would be right. And it would still matter that I remembered it the way I remembered it. Um, and then the other thing that I will say is the one person who I did that with is my son. And I let him read all the conversation. I read them to him. Um, and I told him anything that he wanted gone was gone and he didn't have to explain it. Okay, we have another I feel really excited that I, I feel like I'm like announcing um, lottery numbers or something. We have another share in the chat, you guys. <laughs> I was um, say, Tom, let me see here. what we got. All right, hold on. Oh, All right, hold on. Here. All right, hold on. I'm going to. Here we go. I'm All right, hold on. I'm going to share this one second. Go away. All right, stop share. Hold on. I got to share the other one. Here we go. Share. Oh, this is amazing. Ron, I caught you smoking. You told me not to tell anyone. Did I? I was like six. You were really good at saying the perfect thing to make me sad. <laughs> oh, this is brilliant. <laughs> This is so amazing. Okay, there's so Thank much. Thank you, Tom, for sharing this. This is so incredible. Also, I love, okay, so this is, again, like, I love the, the posture of your people. I love their heavy heads. Um, this is just so sweet and wonderful. And the texture of the paper, like, this whole thing, please, frame that. Um, put it somewhere. It's really, really lovely. If anyone, if anyone, oh, I like the funnel, the tunnel between the bubbles. Yeah. Yep. The drop down is amazing. Right. Um, and the detail also with the clothes. I mean, this is just their, their, their hands. That's what I think I'm really responding to. The hands that look like they're like fists are amazing. The shoulders. <laughs> the shoulders. Yeah. You really got some good post posture there. This is really, really amazing. Oh, good. Um, I know we are starting to be toward the end of our time, I think. Um, if well, anyone feels like yeah, we, yeah, we have a question for sure. from Maryland that says, what if we introduce other characters? Is there any caution you advise about that so not to bog down the graphic novel? Oh yeah, okay. So um if you introduce like within the within a single conversation, I'm assuming that is, yeah. Um if if that's not the question, then jump in and tell me that's not what you mean. Okay. Um I think actually, unlike when you're writing narratively, it's really easy to introduce other characters um, visually um, or throughout as it progresses. Yeah. So I will I will say in mine, um, there's times where my mom pops in and out of conversations because that is my mother too, by the way, like you will be talking and then my mother will magically appear to say something and, and then disappear. Um, and actually the way that our eye takes in that conversation or that, that information rather, um, it really does work. And, and one of the things that you can do is you can show a tiny bit of that character out of the frame or way back in the frame so that when that character emerges to 
say something, they haven't just come from nowhere unless they are my mom who really does come from nowhere. Like a genie, like a crazy genie. All right. <laughs>